loves us more than any, any, anybody else. Now, how can you say, I love you? You can say it with words, right? Let's try that. I love you. Okay, that's a good way. You also give somebody a hug, right? That's a way of giving a, a, a love. Some people do sign language. This means, I love you. Excellent job. I love you. How did Jesus say, I love you? Yeah, yeah, but there's another, that's good, but there's another very special way that Jesus said he loves us. Take a look right here. What is that? That is the cross, and that is the best way ever that Jesus said I love you. He said, I love you so much that I'm going to give you all of myself, and that cross is to tell you how much I love you. You. So I want you to think every time you see that cross, I want you to hear in your ear or in your heart Jesus saying, I love you. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you so much that Jesus loved us enough to give us everything he had on the cross so that you could show us how much he loved us and that. By your love, we could be your children forever and ever. Help us to, to follow you and to, to love you back and to say I love you and share your love with all of our friends and the world around us. We pray this in Jesus' name and we all say together, amen. I love you all. I love you. Go back to your seats.
the Pike Claire Ona. Are there other joys and concerns that we can lift together this morning? Mary Ellen. Our clients, um, the two of them were fostering the hospice. Mm -hmm. The Keelers, so your client, the Keelers, is fathering you in the hospice. Help. Hold, yes, we want to continue to pray for holding Eastman as he continues to heal and recover and adjust to what life is going to be like after his accident and his injury. Let's go together before God in prayer. Gracious and heavenly Lord, you, uh, you are present in the midst of all of these situations. You know the names that we have lifted up this morning, Peggy and Katie and the Keeler's dad. Um, you, you hear all the names that we could not lift before you this morning because those names are too near and dear to us. Wrap us all and comfort us with your loving embrace. Help us open our hearts and open our minds to hear you this morning because you are here and you have a word for us. Help us find calm in this place in your house. Help us find peace that comes with your presence so that we might be nourished and sustained to go out and make disciples in the world of this week. And let us now pray together as Jesus taught his original disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hear this first scripture reading from Galatians chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness can be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now at the time of our worship together, we offer up ourselves. We offer up our hearts, we offer up our prayers, and we also give back to God his tithes and our offerings. Amen. You guys, please sing with us this morning. Uh, we changed some things because... Felt the press for some reason. Our song was changed because I couldn't sing the song we couldn't sing. Well, this goes perfectly with that scripture, so thank you, Lord. Thank you. Oh! 
I crouched down when I saw the rusty object poking through the hillside. I picked it up and I thought, this must be very old. Then I realized that the reddish hue I thought was rust was actually dry blood. I knew immediately who it belonged to. Jesus. As I held the nail in my hand, the images of that day filled my mind. I am Simon the Cyrene. I came to Jerusalem for Passover. But this Passover will be like none other. I was curious, like so many others, what all the fuss was about surrounding this rabbi. I knew that he had been arrested, nearly flogged to death, and now he was to be crucified. I worked my way through the large crowd to try to get to the front of the path so I could get a good view. <coughs> And I saw Jesus coming up the path. He was struggling with the weight of that large cross. As he came in front of me, he stumbled and he fell to the ground. He dropped the cross. He had already been nearly torn to shreds, but the, the guards, they shouted at him and they kicked him some more. But his body was too broken. He could carry the cross no longer. When the guard kicked me out of the crowd to carry the cross, I couldn't believe. I mean, I was just there to watch. I was a curious bystander. But when the guard grabbed my arm and pulled me into the path, I knew better than to disobey. So I went to pick up the cross, and I'm a healthy man in good, in good shape, but even I struggled with the burden of the cross. So the centurion called over the other guards and told them to help me carry the cross. I'll never forget that long walk up the road to the place of the skulls they call Golgotha. I got to the top of the hill and the guard instructed me where to put the cross, so I set it down and quickly jumped back into the crowd so that I could not be noticed. I stood there and I watched Jesus cry to his father. I watched Jesus die on that cross. They buried him in a tomb, sealed it with a big rock, and even had a guard out front. But three days later, his disciples say that he came back to life. They say that he appeared <clears throat> before many people. This changes everything. And now I must choose. Will I just stand and watch? Or will I too follow him? So there were spectators, people who were just, just there to watch. They were drawn by the crowd and the commotion, watchers. That's what Simon was, there just to watch. 
The Bible tells us that Simon was from Cyrene. That's in northern Africa, what we today call Libya. And, and Jews had scattered and spread all over the world. And so we know from another ancient text, 1 Maccabees, that for the prior 300 years, Jews had lived in Cyrene before this particular Holy Week. Uh, they would eventually even have their own synagogue in Jerusalem. And so Simon had probably come to Jerusalem as a merchant, but mostly as a pilgrim for the Passover. But this would be a Passover like none other. A rabbi named Jesus had been arrested and charged from the Roman side, charged with disturbing the peace and insurrection. And from the Jewish side with disturbing the peace and blasphemy. He was judged and he was flogged. And then he was sentenced to crucifixion. Now, the, the Jews had no authority to practice capital punishment. So Rome issued the judgment and Rome carried out the sentence. And, and, and first they would flog the prisoner with leather straps, with rock and glass and thorns tied in so that it would bring someone to within an inch of their death. And then as, as much an example as punishment, they would be nailed to a cross. And, and if, one, if, if one being executed lasted too long, then the Roman soldiers would break their legs to hasten the suffocation. And to add insult to injury, sometimes these prisoners, as on that day, were forced to carry their own crossbeam upon their flogged shoulders to the place of their execution. That's where Simon stood watching. Somewhere along what, what we call in Jerusalem today the Via Della Rosa, the way of sorrows, the way of suffering. Jesus would, would just simply pass by, and, and at that moment, Simon was compelled. He was changed from being just a spectator to being a participant. Hear the word of God. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace called the Praetorium and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And then they began to call out to him, Hail, the king of the Jews! Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And, and when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe, put his own clothes on him, and then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, and then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. This is the word of God for the people of God. On the cross. will do. Within the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the cross of Jesus is the pivot point for all of human history, past, present, and future. The Apostle Paul will write that God's choice of the cross as the instrument Jesus would use for salvation would, would, be, uh, would be found strategic. The Jews and the Greeks would think it foolish because who's ever heard of a Messiah conquering by dying? And the Jews would find it foolishness, a stumbling block for the law in their book says in Deuteronomy 20, 21 that anyone who is hanging from a tree or a cross 
is under God's curse. So there's no way that, that this man could be the anticipated Messiah of God. And yet what Paul tells us is that the cross is actually the wisdom of God. Fulfilling in the sacrifice of Jesus both the justice of God and the mercy of God. Hear that? Justice and mercy. Because sin must be punished by a holy God. But in dying, Jesus, the sinless one, could then provide to all the world. God's forgiveness and grace. The cross changed everything. It settled everything. And it compels everyone to move from being just a spectator to being a participant. You can't stay neutral or impartial. The cross. It took a, a, about till the second century for the followers of Jesus to kind of see the transition of the cross from being this disgusting instrument of torture and death to being the symbol of victory. We, we read in Tertullian, who was in the second century another a lawyer, a theologian, he was also like Simon from North Africa, that that was the first time followers of Jesus had begun making the sign of the cross. On themselves. And, and you know, you can carry a cross in your pocket, or you can wear a cross around your neck, or you can make the sign of the cross on you. But but the cross is the way that we declare what Paul proclaimed in the Galatians 2 passage you heard. Jesus not only settles our account with God, but Jesus' life on the cross also becomes the means of our freedom. From the bondage of sin. There's, a, there's an old gospel hymn. How many of you have ever heard Rock of Ages? But for me. Okay, a few of us, yeah. Rock of Ages. Here, here's the way it starts. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flow. Be of sin the double Saved from wrath and make me pure. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So here comes the double cure. First, we are forgiven. Christ takes the wrath and the judgment of sin upon himself. Hear this, every sin that you and I commit, past, present, and future, has been forgiven in the singular act of Jesus upon the cross. Can you sense the magnitude of that? I said every sin. All have been forgiven. Forgiven one time for all. Now it still has to be applied through confession and repentance and faith. But the good news of Jesus Christ is that the forgiveness of God is there waiting for you and me. And the other part of the cure, the double cure, is freedom from the power of sinning. Now, this may, this may blow you away. If by faith, if we are disciples of Christ, and if we have been crucified with Christ, listen, we no longer have to sin. Doesn't that sound unbelievable? But it's the gospel. Now, I didn't say that we wouldn't sin. But I wouldn't sin. But I don't have to. The cross doesn't eliminate the possibility of sinning. But I pray for you and me, it lowers the probability a bit. But what Romans 6 says is, For sin shall not be your master. 
For you are no longer under law, but under grace. Sinning only has the power in our lives that we give it. And by the cross, we are compelled to pursue holiness in response to God's good gift of forgiveness and grace. The cross changes everything by its power and its grace. There was a man once named Saul. He was compelled by the cross. Saul was a member of the Sanhedrin. That's the, the Jewish high court. And, and the book of Acts tells us that, that Saul went out and pursued and sought out followers of Jesus so that he might imprison them and take them before the high court and, when possible, have them stoned to death. But while traveling one day on, on the road to Damascus to carry out his work, he suddenly had a vision of Jesus crucified and risen. And a bright light from heaven knocked him to his knees. And three days later, his sight returned. He became that day Paul, disciple, follower of Jesus. And rather than hunting disciples, he spent the rest of his life making disciples. Proclaiming Jesus as Lord and Savior, starting new churches, and writing a good bit of what we consider to be the New Testament of Scripture. A man named Maximilian was also compelled by the cross. His full name was Father Maximilian Kolb. He was a Polish priest, and he was arrested for his um, disobedience to the Nazis, and he was sent off to Auschwitz. And on August 4th, 1941, the camp's commandant, in response to the presumed attempted escape of some prisoners, chose 10 prisoners and sentenced them to the slow, agonizing death by starvation. One of the prisoners, Franziszek, uh, begged for his life on behalf of his wife and children, and Maximilian, stepped up and offered to take his place and join those who were condemned to death. Maximilian prayed with them, comforted them, and offered them last rites when the time came. Ten days later, on August 14th, Cole was the last of them alive, and they put him to death by lethal injection. Ceremoniously cremated like so many of the other millions. But you see, it was for Maximilian, it was the cross, the cross of Jesus that freed him to be able to offer his life in love and sacrifice for others, just as Jesus had offered his life for him. And on that day on the way to Golgotha, Simon was compelled by the cross. Now what we don't know is whether Simon really did stay, stay around and watch the execution of Jesus or whether he hurried away to avoid getting any more involved. Either way, it's very likely he was still in Jerusalem. A few days later, as that word spread about an empty tomb and Jesus being seen alive. And even though Simon is never mentioned again in Scripture, there's a clue that, that Simon probably did have his life changed that day. In the passage I read from Mark's Gospel, Simon of Cyrene is identified this way, the father of Alexander and Rufus. In Romans 16, the Apostle Paul sends a very special greeting to Rufus and his mother. Early church tradition says that Rufus and Alexander, Simon's sons, had grown to be leaders in the church. Jesus and the cross changes everything. Simon the leper was certainly changed, wasn't he? 
The centurion at the cross was certainly changed. Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, they were certainly changed. And Simon of Cyrene was changed. And the cross can change you and me. And don't we need changing? Don't we need the double cure? Why would we? In his book, No Wonder They Call Him Savior, Max Lucado writes, There was something about the crucifixion that made every witness either step toward it or from it. It simultaneously compelled and repelled. And today, 2,000 years later, the same is true. The cross is the watershed. The cross is the continental divide. The cross is Normandy. And you are either on one side or the other. A choice is demanded. We can do what we want with the cross. We can examine its history. We can study its theology. We can reflect upon its prophecy. Yet the one thing we can't do is walk away in neutral. No sense is permitted. The cross in its absurd splendor doesn't allow that. That's the one luxury that God in his awful mercy doesn't permit. On which side are you? The cross. Jesus, God himself in the flesh, the Holy One, undeserving of death, offers his life for you right? as a sacrifice of love and forgiveness and grace. Jesus, crucified and risen, stands ready today to redeem us and change us and make us new. We would not let our, our pride or our reason keep us from the truth. Like Saul, drop the scales from our eyes. Help us to see. Help us to believe. Try to take
Amen. Yeah.